sometimes it might actually frame a performance around a certain idea that I've come across. For example, Ron Bart's talking about Cy Twombly. Here is a paradox. A fact is more purely defined if it is not clean. Take a common object. It is not its new and virgin state which best accounts for its essence. It is rather a state in which it is deformed. A little worn, a little dirtied, a little forlorn. The truth of things is best read in refuse. It is the smear that we find the truth of redness. There's a wobbly line that we find the truth of pencil. If I listen to Mozart, my material is a contact mic and a piece of, say, sandpaper. I drag the contact mic across the piece of sandpaper. I should be performing that with the same consideration as Clifford Curzon is giving to the Mozart. Comparing your work with Mozart obviously sounds incredibly pretentious on one level, and I, I can see that, but it's the way I'm going to do it, like it or not. There's the Brock painting of Man with Guitar. From the very earliest period for me, that was an important image. I think the reason I probably chose a guitar was because of the, the image aspect in the way that the guitar was deconstructed, the man was deconstructed, and then spread equally across the canvas with no particular focal point. This often got me to think about how does a guitar sound if it's deconstructed, then reconstructed? What is it I could do to actually find my own voice? My own unique voice. A voice which no other artist or player had ever developed before. What I did essentially was to take the thinking and the agenda of painting and directly put that into the electric guitar. It was looking at Jackson Pollock and the American painters that needed to find their own voice to, to break with the European traditions. It seemed to me that Pollock did that in a flash by taking an easel painting canvas from the easel and laying it on the ground. And I also in a flash took the regular guitar, taking it and actually laying it initially on the floor a whole number of things happened. One thing is that normal guitar techniques became inappropriate. I could take a knife, thread it through the strings, position it over the pickup, tap the knife, and it would kind of rattle in a seesaw. Moment. And suddenly I found ambiguity because it wasn't clear what that was. You could see the sounds happening in front of you. In fact, in life, walking around the streets, you'd look for objects which you could lay on the guitar. far the most important musical experiences have been within the context of the AMM.
Is there a gap between them? There's the, a slight the gap, yeah. And then you've got Yeah, the it's almost you can that. say this, the surf is, is pure here. It's yeah. a I probably irritated Eddie more than he irritated me. I was probably more strident in making demands. I think sometimes in music groups, it's, that tension is important. Yemen is, is an improvisatory group formed between November 1965 and March, April, June 66. I think one thing in life in the AMM, particularly in its early period, was important for us was the notion that you can only find yourself in the company of others. that I don't think I would have found my own voice, my own unique voice, outside of the AMM. We decided that we we would invent a new music that we admired and respected what black musicians had done in America. They invented something called jazz. And we were not going to appropriate their music. It's their music. But we were inspired by what they did. When Cornelius met musicians from AMM, he was astounded that we could actually play as well as he could play. I mean, we were street kids, skinny, white, European street kids. We were poor. He wanted to understand more about how we could do what we did without the, the background. Where does it all come from? What he gave us in return was a world of modern classical music, which kind of described itself in the most extreme ways. I think the guitar sound in AMM became kind of pivotal to the way the other instruments sounded. This hard-edged abstraction, very industrial, quite noisy, quite ugly, allowed a particular way of, of laminating the AMM experience. Willing 
to wait was important in the AMM. With this hard edge abstraction, encountering the beautiful grand piano sound that John Tilbury, for example, or the very sharpness of Eddie Prevost's bowing, that the guitar was actually quite ugly in a sense, quite dirty. But there was something in that dirtiness, I think, which contrasted with the very classical clean sounds that Tilbury would be producing and the very rich sounds that Eddie Preville would be producing. I was introduced by Cornelius Cardius through John Cage of the possibility of the radio as a musical instrument. It reminded me of Robert Rauschenberg's use of uh, newspaper cuttings. So I remember we were playing Cornelius Cardius' treatise and all the circles in the graphic score, I was using a radio. A big circle came off in the score, so I turned the radio on, tuned into the most wonderful kind of spoken voice, and allowed it to linger. Just fitted what we were doing. AMM is an improvisational group, but when we invited people to join, they were never improvisers ideally with no history of improvisation at all. What we did not want was an improviser to join AMM. So the first is Cornelius Cardio, who had no experience of improvisation. Then Christian Wolf joined us for a while. We're here. <laughs> 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 it's wonderful well, it's to see you. See you. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So you guys, AMM, were, were there and were part of the show. And I got recruited to just, you know, want to join? Sure, why not? All I remember is there was a concert. It was a sort of a big deal concert. It's like Queen Elizabeth Hall or somewhere, was somewhere yeah. on the South Bank. I think my guitar was not plugged in. And so I, I just played anyway. And I did, wasn't sure whether it was, you know, you don't know what you hear, whether no, the, who's you, making the sound, yeah, especially when it's dark, because it's, it's just, which is a wonderful kind of feeling. It's yeah. just, where's the wall? Am I doing that? Are you doing it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Sometimes you hear this horrible sound, yeah. and you think, God, I wish they'd stop. And you stop playing and realize it was you. <laughs> We seem so keen to create genres of divisions between musics. For me, there's just music. And there seems to be no problem in an art gallery of actually placing a work from 2018 with something from 1066. When you look at a painting, the only important thing is how it resonates with you. And I think that's true with music too. Yeah, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty yeah, extraordinary. At any point in the last 50, 60 years, 50 years of playing, someone asked me what was the most important aspect of, of performing. Pretty sure I would have always said to inspire others to do their work. I think it's really important to give permission. But I think also to inspire.
someone I read put it like this that when you when you go on a journey you go for a walk in a forest or something that the, the rocks and the trees that you pass are not the journey the journey is this other thing that's in your head and it, to me it doesn't have any sound it's, a, it's an experience if I say to you do you know Mahler's Fifth Symphony you say, you say yeah and immediately you kind of play Mahler's Fifth Symphony in your head have you seen Caravaggio's Taking of Christ in Dublin you say yeah and you visualise it immediately. See, when I think of music, I think now of, like, Dvorak. There's no, there's no sound. But when Beethoven was sitting writing his late quartets, he's deaf. But there's music. Five years ago, I was diagnosed with uh, Parkinson's. One thing you're likely to suffer is a, a tremor. Principally, it's going to be a tremor in the right hand. So I kind of lost the ability to play solos because if I have a contact mic in my, my right hand, I would want to manipulate that with the utmost sensitivity, as if I was playing a piece of Mozart. I lost the ability to do that. It's vibrating all the time. So the only way I can make it not vibrate, like, like, like now, is take a deep breath. In the skull, we have these peepholes, which are the kind of conduits for communicating with the rest of the world. And as the Parkinson's uh, develops, the peepholes become more constricted. They kind of close down their aperture is lessened very slowly, year by year, week by week, month by month, minute by minute, second by second. It is contracting and these clicks happen. There's a fatalistic aspect to, for me of Parkinson's that it will do what it wants to do. Whether I like it or not, it will have its way. So way of recognizing that was to make a click track a track which would just do what it does in a... and you wait for the click and you wait and then you get a click then you wait and you live between the clicks but it's about you inside the skull not able to do all the things that you want to do but just doing the things you can do. So maybe we could turn the lights off. And why has it gone dark? I'm seeing the world from inside my skull, which has been affected by the brain not developing dopamine. So the, the performance becomes a performance of what I cannot do and a recognition of my own vulnerability.
it's always trying to move a step forward in developing what you're about, but also recognizing the kind of luggage that you have. One poem starts, I lay my heart on the curved table, filled only with emotions. Why should I trouble to play? A breeze will come and sweep the strings. I don't think I would be doing this if it wasn't for Parkinson's. So Parkinson's is actually making me look afresh. So the guitar is still there, but what is a guitar? What, what, what do you have to have in your hands to call it a guitar? I don't know what a guitar is, actually, when it comes right down to it. I haven't got a clue.